This video is being posted and uploaded on July 31st, 2024, because my records of the month this month came super late than usual from Vinyl Me Please. As they say, it's hard to keep this stuff on track when you don't get it until the last minute, but sometimes I get these very early in the month and I slack off on them, so I probably was just on the later list for this month. At any rate, let's see what we received from Vital Me Please in July of 2024. This month, I went with the classics and the essentials tracks, and I will be honest, I was a little bit hesitant on these two picks this month because for me, if I haven't heard something, like if I've not heard any of these records before, I try not to sample it on Apple Music before I get it on vinyl, especially if I know that I'm definitely going to be getting something on vinyl, like I knew I was going to be getting these. And because I only own one of each of these artists and one only recently, this was truly a month where I was completely letting Vinyl Me Please choose for me. Now, quick note, you might have seen or you might not have seen, but I thought that I would mention it here since if you're watching these videos, you're probably interested in Vinyl Me Please in some way. They are actually making some changes to the tracks that you choose each month for your membership, starting with their discontinuing the rock track and they're discontinuing the country track, which for me is not a huge deal, but if you're a super completist about vinyl and you want all the numbers of a complete set of something, both of these series will be coming to their ends. So personally, I only have one country track and I only have a handful of the rock tracks. I do have the very first one and I talked about that one in a previous video, The Strokes, which is a very awesome album. And depending on what the last one is, or maybe even not, I might just end up getting it to have the first and the last ones of the set. I eventually want to get all of the first tracks of each of the tracks from Vinyl Me Please. That is just part of the collector in me, but it is also music. So getting into something just because it's number one of a series might lead you to liking a completely new artist. It did for me with The Strokes. So that'll be a theme of today's video, getting into some new or unfamiliar stuff. And that leads us to the first track. However, remember something, please. I am not sponsored or work for Vinyl Me Please in any way. I am a member just like you might be a member and I have been for a few years now and I've gone back and collected a lot of their records from their back catalog, but nothing here was sent to me for free. However, if you wanna sign up for Vinyl Me Please and get a discount for up to $80 off a year membership, I have links in the description that can help out with that and I get matches on those links too. So we all get some great vinyl and it works out for everybody. If you don't wanna subscribe or spend any money, you should hit subscribe to this channel because it's free and you can continue finding out about Vinyl Me Please stuff from my channel. The essential record of the month for July of 2024 is Joni Mitchell, The Hissing of Summer Lawns, originally released in 1975. This is her seventh album, and this was released originally on Asylum Records. The reissue is done with Rhino Records, but right away, something sticks out to me with this Vinyl Me Please reissue, which is it has the old Obies for Essentials, as we will see with the updated Obies for the classic records. So maybe this was picked from an earlier batch and delayed laid for some reason, though it is a summer title record, so I would imagine it always had a summer release plan for it. It also, for the first time that I can tell anyways, and this is going to be a sticking out for me as a theme in this video, for an Essentials Record of the Month, this has no extras, no artwork or booklet, which is very odd to me. It is done on green vinyl, Two LPs cut at 45 RPM by Ryan Smith at Sterling Sound. This is triple A cut from the original master tapes. And this green matches the direct to board printing jacket, which is a custom artwork done by Joni Mitchell. And the jacket is very, very nice with the original embossing that you would find on the original jacket. And in this artwork, Joni Mitchell actually includes a little picture of her house, as well as the Burundi tribe that she uses for samples on this record. Now, the vinyl came for this flat with no issues, so that is very good, like no scratches or anything like that. And this just feels incomplete for some reason, being an essential record of the month and not having any of the extras and not kind of being updated with the Obi here, but oh well, it is always about the music, and so let's get to that. Some context here, 
I am not a huge Joni Mitchell fan, or at least I have not been in the past. I've been getting into more and more folk music because of Vinyl Me Please, actually. And when I hear Joni Mitchell's name, folk music is immediately what I think of. But as we're going to find out with this record, you shouldn't. And there is a period of her career that she really got into jazz and fusion. And that's actually what this is. So it's funny. I went into this record of the month thinking, okay, I'm going to add some more folk music to my collection with Joni Mitchell and I come out with an awesome groover that I think is really, really cool. Joni Mitchell's forte into jazz started in 1974 with her most commercially successful album actually called Court and Spark. And on this record, she brought in some musicians from the band LA Express as well as some musicians from the Crusaders who are one of my all-time favorite jazz funk groups. They also go by the name the Jazz Crusaders sometimes, but these musicians later go on tour with her to support the album Court and Spark, and this is the first time that Joni Mitchell was backed by a live band, and they released the record Miles of Isles, which is a live album later that year in 1974, and the success of all this leads her back to the studio for this album, The Hissing of Summer Lawns, in 1975, and this record really just showcases the musicians that she brought in for Court and Spark and takes it up a notch, I think. This album actually debuted at number four on the Billboard charts at the time, but it was actually also very lambasted by the critics when it was released, which I think it's just hilarious. Apparently Rolling Stone completely trashed it and they call the music uninspired and they say, read it first, then listen to it, which screams to me that they just want her to be a folk singer. And it just goes to show how forward thinking artists like Joni Mitchell were of the time of not wanting to be labeled just a folk singer and how critics just sometimes can't handle that. You are who we say who you are. And yet this still reached number four on the Billboard charts. Imagine if an album like this were to go number four on the Billboard charts today. I'm just going to put that out there. Joe Sample is on this, as well as a bunch of other musicians of the Crusaders, as well as, like I said, members of the LA Express. James Taylor is also on this, Graham Nash and David Crosby. And this album is actually credited with having the first use of of a sample loop in a commercially released album with the sample of the Burundi African drummers on the song Jungle Line. And they also appear on the cover in the embossed cover as well. Along with those samples of the African drummers, the album also uses the use of the ARP synthesizer, which is kind of unique to Joni Mitchell's work. I guess she's never really used one of those synthesizers before. Plus it might be one of the first earliest albums to use one of those synths, which it's a very unique sounding synthesizer and on that track Jungle Line it's it's a very cool track that kind of sounds very much ahead of its time and apparently Prince is known as quoted as saying that this album is one of the last albums that he can listen to from start to finish so he was a very big fan of this album and I like Prince so that's pretty cool Personally, I think the music here is actually downright funky at times, and it grooves really hard, and my only complaint on it, honestly, for me, is that I think some of the tracks are too short. I wanted more of this record, and this being cut at 45 RPM, the bass really drives hard, and her vocals sound very good. Another great pressing from Brian Smith, but I will say that this is odd that it's done on 45, because there is a lot of runout groove on these records, but... I like 45 RPM records, so I'm not going to complain about that, even though technically I just did. I actually think that her voice range in combination with the sound of the deep bass grooves from the Crusaders works perfectly on this. And I apparently am not alone on this because on her next three albums, she actually starts bringing in more and more of Weather Report. She has Jaco Pastorius, and then she has Wayne Shorter and Alex Acuna and Don Elias and eventually Herbie Hancock. And they eventually released the album Mingus in 1979. So this is a great recording of her time in the jazz fusion scene of the 1970s. And I love that Joni Mitchell explored this path. And I wish it was a little bit more well received at the time. And more could have came of it. But of course, you know, everything has to be like, you know, number one records. That's all that matters. This is definitely inspiring me to go check out the other two albums with Jocko. I do have the Mingus album already, but I am definitely full on for a Joni Mitchell fan at this point. So thank you very much, Vinyl B, please, for choosing this one. 
Next, for the classic record of the month, this is Alice Coltrane's Transfiguration Live. This is now the second Alice Coltrane from Vinyl Me Please that I've gotten this year, if you are keeping score. And this is the third Vinyl Me Please release from her. And this is, like I said, a live recording, originally released in 1978, Recorded at Schoenberg Hall, UCLA, Los Angeles, California on April 16th, 1978 with overdubbed strings on the track Prima, which was recorded at Westlake Audio in Los Angeles, California. This is a trio with Alice Coltrane on organ, Reggie Workman on bass, and Roy Haynes on drums. And this has the updated Obi that has all of the information on the front of it, unlike the previous one that we mentioned. And this reissue is a double LP on black vinyl, triple A lacquer, cut by Ryan Smith at Sterling Sound from the original master tapes, pressed at GZ Vinyl, and this was originally released from Warner Brothers, and this comes out on the original white Warner labels, and this vinyl is 180 grams. This includes a direct-to-board gatefold jacket with a listening notes booklet from Harmony Holiday, which, as always, is a great addition with these. I'm still surprised and shocked that the Joni Mitchell didn't come with one, especially an album like this that I'm not too familiar with this or any Alice Coltrane stuff, really. But apparently, according to All Music's Tom Jurek, if you can own only one Alice Coltrane album, this should be it. And this is actually the last Alice Coltrane album that she did commercially until 2004's Translinear Light. And it was considered her farewell to the jazz business. And there is a lot of spiritual context that goes involved with both Alice Coltrane and John Coltrane that I admittedly don't fully understand. I don't get into the ideas of transcending light and darkness into silhouettes of ourselves. I'm probably just not smart enough for it all. However, I do love the music and I can get completely lost in this music. And if that is me connecting with the spirit, then so be it. But there are five original compositions on this, along with an extended version of John Coltrane's Leo. And the musicians here that accompany her in my opinion, are a perfect match for her. Reggie Workman is a Philly bassist who previously played with John Coltrane, and Roy Haynes is a legendary drummer in his own right, and I love the timbre and the sound of her organ. It's it's very hypnotic, and both Reggie Workman's bass and Roy Haynes' drums complement this very, very well. This must have been an insane concert to just be at and completely lose yourself in the music and all of this improv and new experimentation stuff that is going on. There's a lot of free playing on this, but there is something about the sound of this organ, like I said, that, that just puts me in like a trance with this. And I'm usually not that into free jazz stuff, but this has a really, really cool vibe to it. And for being live, this sounds fantastic. It's very powerful and has lots of dynamics which can get lost in a lot of 70s live recordings. Again, not one that I would have chosen at a record store. This is probably something that I probably would have completely passed up for some more familiar stuff. But once again, I'm glad that Vinyl Me Please chose this and I can expand my collection a little bit more. I'm going to have to go back and get the first Alice Coltrane from Vinyl Me Please now so I can have all three of them at this point. But it is very cool. If you like Alice Coltrane at all, you should definitely consider picking up this pressing. I'm not sure if there are other audiophile pressings of it out there, but but to have this one is very awesome. And like I said, it sounds fantastic. Okay, well, hopefully we'll be hearing about the August records a little bit sooner in the month, and hopefully sometime soon, my pre-orders will start coming in from Bottom Me Please. I'm trying to be very patient about that, but it would be cool to get some of them to share them with you, especially this year. If you like this video, you're absolutely gonna like this one right here. I just click it right now and see if I'm wrong, or tell your friends about this one and watch this one. I will see you on the next one.